This is Dale Strickler with Green Cover Seed. It's a lovely May 22nd day here in Bladen, Nebraska. We're at our for perennial forage plots here, and I uh, just wanted to show you uh, some of the characteristics of these if you're considering planting some, some perennial forages. What we have here are two varieties of tall fescue. And fescue, uh, one person told me that tall fescue is the best forage grass there ever was, except for a couple things. Cows don't like it and it makes them sick. And a lot of that reputation, uh, poor reputation of tall fescue, is because of the presence of an endophyte fungus. Uh, a fungus that lives inside the plant that creates toxins. In the absence of that, tall fescue is a wonderful forage. It has the ability to stay green almost all winter long where it's well adapted, uh, which makes it particularly valuable for winter grazing, much better winter grazing resource than really any other perennial forage grass. Um, what we have here, this is Kentucky 31 fescue. This is a endophyte free version called Kentucky 32. And the, the difference between these two is the presence and absence of the toxic endophyte. So uh, this plant, and they look very similar. Uh, you can see there is a, a slight difference between them. Uh, the Kentucky 32 is a little later to head out, not quite so stemmy as the Kentucky 31. Um, and because this one does not have the endophyte, it's going to be much better forage quality than the old Kentucky 31. So uh, if you are planting a fescue for the purpose of pasture, I would either plant a, an endophyte free or a novel endophyte. The novel endophyte has an endophyte in the plant, but it's an endophyte that does not produce toxins. They are more expensive, but the endophyte itself does confer heat and drought tolerance to the plant. It's a benefit to the plant. So the novel endophytes really are the best of both worlds. Uh, but compared to the Kentucky 32, you do pay a higher price than just straight endophyte free like this variety. What we have here is uh, we've got uh, perennial ryegrass and uh, then we have fasciololium. Uh, ryegrasses are really the standard for forage quality in, in a grass. Um, ryegrasses have a higher sugar content, higher palatability, exceptional forage quality, very digestible. But as you can see, the ryegrass compared to the fescue is just not as productive. Ryegrasses are, uh, in the in the Great Plains region at least, um, here in Nebraska, Kansas, um, Oklahoma, the perennial ryegrass just lacks heat and drought tolerance. The physiology of the plant that makes it so high in forage quality also makes it very vulnerable to climatic extremes, heat, drought, and cold. It's not as, as tolerant of extreme drought and summer temperatures, nor as tolerant as winter cold as like the fescue. But it does have that exceptional forage quality. So a lot of people I know will just plant five pounds of perennial or uh, um, intermediate ryegrass every winter just to boost the forage quality on, on their perennial grass stands. And they know it's going to die out after two or three years, but that's okay. Now, plant breeders have looked at these, and they say these are very similar plants. They're closely related, the intermediate, or the ryegrass and the tall fescue. And they've actually crossed the two. And the cross between fescue and ryegrass is called festulolium. And this is this plant here, spring green festulolium. And uh, the idea was to combine the best, the, the quality of the, the ryegrass with the toughness of the fescue. And it works extremely well. 
except the plants tend to be very short-lived. They don't live very long. The uh, Festulolium really is about a two to three year lifespan on a product, but it does establish very quickly. It's got good vigor that very first year. So a lot of people will put Festulolium in a perennial grass stand so they can get to that very first forage harvest a little quicker. And it's a great product uh, for that purpose. Just don't plant it and expect it to live 5, 10, 20 years. It'll be gone. So either plant it as part of a short-term stand or in a mixture with longer-lived longer components. Okay. Uh, where's a good spot here? To, here. Okay. This, uh, this is Timothy. And we have a lot of people request Timothy as a plant. And there's, there's reason for that. It's very soft leaf, very palatable, very high forage quality for a grass. Not quite ryegrass uh, type production, but it, it is very good quality. Um, but I'm not a big fan of Timothy. Um, Timothy has no heat tolerance. Timothy has no drought tolerance. Timothy has also very poor grazing tolerance. Most of the people that want Timothy are horse people, people who have horses. Timothy absolutely does not tolerate the close grazing pressure that horses will put on a grass. So this is just something I hardly ever recommend. One thing that Timothy does have in its favor, it establishes quickly. The seed is very small, so you get a lot of seeds in a pound. Um, one reason that a lot of uh, seed companies will put a fair amount of Timothy in a grass mix because it cheapens the mix. You can get more uh, more profit out of the mix, and it does give you fairly quick results. And, and so a lot of people will do that. I'm not a fan of the grass or the practice myself. So. What we have here are a pair of wheat grasses, and, and wheat grasses uh, tend to be more drought tolerant than your other cool season grasses. A lot of them are adapted to arid western rangelands. Uh, these are kind of products of choice when we're going below 20 inches of rainfall. Um, we really kind of gravitate towards the wheat grasses if you want a drought tolerant cool season grass. Now drought tolerant does not necessarily mean drought productive. These will survive drought, but they may not produce in a drought. Uh, this one is western wheatgrass. Western wheatgrass is a native grass. Um, it did grow naturally, does grow naturally over Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, Wyoming, etc. Uh, the western plains. It likes heavy clay soils and it does spread through rhizomes. Now, some of the advantages of western wheatgrass are, are that it does spread, but it tends to form a very open sod, and you can see there's a lot of gaps in here. Uh, that's one reason I really like western wheatgrass in a mixture, not by itself. Um, these, this open space does allow legumes to grow well with it. You can see, if you look down here, we've got a lot of volunteer rye that came up in the western wheatgrass that really didn't come up in the other forage species. So it, it does let a lot of sunlight through. If you don't have it mixed with something, that's sunlight that goes to waste, just hits the ground. So I like western wheatgrass. It's a uh, it's, uh, tough, it's a survivor. Um, it does uh, mix well, even though it, it forms a, a sod it does mix well and play well with other forage species. This other wheatgrass here, this is pubescent wheatgrass. You can see the pubescent wheatgrass is just a bigger, more robust, um, more productive wheatgrass than the western. Um, it is fairly drought tolerant. It's very similar to intermediate wheatgrass, uh, very closely related species. And like the intermediate, it's very productive grass. Um, this is kind of a species that is tough enough to go on dry land, 
but also productive enough to take advantage of any uh, irrigation or uh, favorable rainfall that you might get during the growing season. And you can see it's the, the forage quality, you know, you can see how leafy this is compared to the relatively stemmy western wheatgrass. So uh, kind of a fan of the pubescent wheatgrass. I think it, it fits a lot of situations that uh, where other cool season grasses don't. Okay, here we have a couple of bromes. Uh, to my right here is smooth brome, which just about everybody in Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, um, most of the eastern uh, prairie and plain states are very familiar with smooth brome. Over here we have meadow brome. And if, if these two plants were separate from each other, it'd be very hard to tell one from the other. Uh, the meadow brome does tend to head out a little bit earlier, but in other respects, very similar looking plants, but they do behave quite a bit differently. Uh, the smooth brome is uh, rhizomatous. It spreads and forms a, a dense sod. Tends to form monocultures, which is one reason a lot of people don't like smooth brome. Um, but it also means that smooth brome is going to fill in gaps in the stand. If you have a thin stand, wait a couple of years, you'll have a thick stand of smooth brome. Very palatable, very drought tolerant. One of the drawbacks of smooth brome, though, is that it's kind of a one and done. It grows tremendously well in April and May, and then it stops, and it's pretty much done for the year. You'll get a little bit of fall growth, but smooth brome just does not tolerate close grazing or haying, and it just doesn't regrow very well. Meadow brome, on the other hand, is much higher regrowth, uh, will grow throughout the summer. It, however, is a bunch grass. It does not form dense sods like the smooth brome. That's a positive in that it will coexist with legumes and other grass species, uh, other, other forbs, much, much better than smooth brome. But it does not fill in and make a, a very dense sod if that is your goal. And for erosion control, I like the smooth brome waterways, uh, high traffic areas, the smooth brome I think is a better choice. For pasture, especially irrigated pasture where you want to get multiple growths, multiple grazings, the meadow brome is a really nice choice. We'll skip over to the, well this is the Makua. Okay. Another brome grass that uh, finds some use is Matua brome grass. And uh, that's what this uh, species is right here. Uh, it's very unique forage grass. Um, it very fast at establishing, very responsive to nitrogen. Um, it it's behaves really unlike your other brome grasses. It's, it's, a, it's a relative of rescue grass. Uh, that's a kind of a wild grass that grows in Oklahoma, Texas. Very, very high forage quality. Even after it heads out, this has exceptional forage quality. You let all these cool season grasses head out, turn animals in here, this will be one of the very first ones they'll graze. It maintains quality after heading. Very unusual for a grass. It is uh, very fast establishing, like I said, but it's also very short lived. So we kind of tend to use it like we do festulolium as part of it to, to boost the early production in a mixture with other longer lived species or as just part of a two or three year uh, forage stand you know mixed with red clover some other short term forages just give you some quick upfront production um, also surprisingly drought tolerant much more drought tolerant than the festival oleum Okay, uh, thank you. Skip. Okay, this is orchard grass, and you can see orchard grass really looks pretty good. Uh, if if orchard grass um, has plenty of nitrogen, it's one of the highest yielding uh, cool season grasses. It establishes really well. It is a bunch grass, but the seed uh, has 
really good seedling vigor. You can see it's established really well here compared to the other grasses. It does tend to lose its quality after it heads out a little worse than, than some of the other grasses, but if it's hayed or grazed on a frequent basis, the regrowth is exceptional. The summer regrowth is better than uh, brome or fescue uh, during, uh, especially if you have plenty of water. <coughs> it is a, a, a little more susceptible to drought than some of your other cool season grasses, depending on variety. Um, I've noticed that each new generation of orchard grass varieties that come out has better and better drought tolerance. I would stay away from some of your older orchard grass varieties, especially out here in the plains. Uh, they just don't have the drought tolerance that the new stuff has. So uh, this is Persist, uh, one of my favorite varieties. Um, I would stay away from older varieties like uh, Penlate, uh, Latar, and especially Potomac. Uh, a lot of the orchard grass on the market is Potomac, has no disease resistance, not very good drought tolerance as well. So, anyhow, I'm a big orchard grass fan. Hey, um, when most people plant pastures, uh, they think about grasses primarily. Also, they may think about legumes, but one very overlooked component of pastures that I think brings a lot to the table are your forbs. And I've got a couple forbs here. This is chicory, and this is plantain. And these two plants have some very unique properties that I think uh, really deserve some merit for including into a perennial pasture mix. Um, number one, they're very deep-rooted plants. Uh, there's been some research done um, on including a high percentage of chicory in a pasture blend. And they found out that the chicory roots, because they are so good at penetrating deep into the soil, that will bring up water from, from very deep in the soil and releases it at night right below the soil surface. They found out, uh, now this was done in a more rain-fed area than here, but if about 30 to 40 percent of the pasture biomass was chicory, that pasture did not suffer from drought stress. I think that's kind of a big deal. It's just, this plant is just able to access water that all the grass species can't. They just don't have deep enough roots. And it tends to be very generous with that water and share it with the rest of the composition. Plantain has a similar ability. Uh, both of these plants tend to grow very well in compacted areas. My pasture, um, my uh, the tire, the wheel tracks where I drive in and out is solid plantain. It's the only thing that tolerates that compacted soil where I've been driving for years. Other advantages of this, the, con the mineral content of these two plants, it's really amazing. The uh, recommended uh, percentage of phosphorus, for example, in the diet of beef cows is about 0.3%. Uh, most forages are about, grasses and legumes are about 0.25. They're slightly deficient, even when they're actively growing and, and nutritious. Chicory, I've seen uh, analysis where it's up a, over 0.6, double the, what the animals need. So if you include a fair amount of uh, chicory or plantain in your, uh, in your pasture mix, that provides a much higher level of mineral nutrition. And of course, mineral supplement is a, a very expensive part of raising livestock. The other advantage of these plants is the presence of bioactive compounds. Chicory, I mean, not only are these plants very digestible, very high in protein, but chicory contains some compounds uh, similar to tannin that helps control uh, legume bloat if it's mixed with alfalfa or clover. The same compounds also are toxic to internal parasites. So there are some companies that actually sell a deworming blend, pasture blend, with the idea that you plant a paddock of this and once a month you rotate through that paddock, get rid of your internal parasites. 
and it's a it's an idea that has merit. This is research proven to expel worms, um, not earthworms, of course, but internal parasites of livestock. The plantain has an antimicrobial effect. In fact, they have done research in Europe and found out that the urine of animals that have been pastured on plantain is an effect. Actually, the urine is an effective antibiotic. There's that much antimicrobial activity in this plant. Um, in the, that, of course, helps uh, promote animal health, helps them ward off infections. Um, it also has a, an effect within the rumen similar to an ionophore, uh, like rumensin or Bovitec. It shifts the microbial rumen population away from the, the microbes that produce methane, which is, are energetically very inefficient, and towards the ones that don't produce methane. That gives you about a 10% boost in feed efficiency. And since methane is a greenhouse gas, this is a, a boon to the environment. Uh, there's a lot of research done in Australia on how much environmental benefit there is to producing or to incorporating plantain in the pasture mix. I think it's very, very, uh, very interesting. Animals like it. It's, it's uh, very nutritious, tends to grow back. Um, to me, these are two must include plants in any perennial pasture species. What's the life span? Are they pretty long lived? Or only a um, plantain will live quite a little while, chicory about five years, but it recedes itself real well. So uh, you can, if, if you don't raise it down. I've got volunteer. You let it go to seed once, and then you got it for years. And years. Okay. Uh, next uh, legume I want to talk about is alfalfa, and I think you can see, guys, if you can kind of pan, look at the alfalfa, and then look at the other pasture legumes over here. You can see the alfalfa is just so much more productive than the other legumes. Um, and if we were to take, if we were to mow this off and take the same footage in the end of July, the alfalfa would probably be this tall again, and all of those other legumes might be brown and crispy, because alfalfa produces more tonnage, more nitrogen, and has deeper tap roots than any other legume that we can grow around here. It just blows every other perennial legume away. You think, wow, this alfalfa is great stuff. Why aren't we using it all the time? Well, it's the greatest pasture plant there is, except for two things. If you don't do it right, alfalfa will kill your cattle, and your cattle will kill the alfalfa. Uh, alfalfa needs rotational grazing management to thrive. You want to let it grow, bloom, graze it down, let it rest until it blooms again, then graze it down. Um, that management method, and, and we have an article on our website that is, goes much more into depth on grazing alfalfa. I've grazed alfalfa for 20 years myself. I love it as a pasture plant, but it is very definitely a high management intensive plant. If you want to learn more about grazing alfalfa instead of just using it as a hay crop go to our website and look up our article on grazing alfalfa i, I think uh, this is a pasture plant that definitely merits inclusion in a lot more situations than what's been used people are scared of bloat they're scared of the level of management it's really not that difficult if a, an idiot like me can pull it off i'm sure most of you can too the varieties of alfalfa that we have here this first one is a, a common alfalfa that we, we uh, uh, contract production on. It actually looks pretty good. When you buy a common alfalfa, it's sometimes you don't know what you get. It's whatever alfalfa seed someone combined and brought in. Uh, we are very confident of the seed source on this. It's a very good, uh, uh, appears to be very good genetics. Uh, it seems to move south pretty well. The price on it is right. It's it's a uh, uh, seems to be a, a good product. 
Um, look at comparing it to some of our other alfalfas. This uh, next one is uh, what we call uh, uh, this is nitro graze, which is a recessed crown alfalfa. Now, what a recessed crown does, most alfalfa crowns have an, an, an elevated crown up above the soil surface. And uh, tell you what, we need to break here. We need to get a shovel, and we'll, we'll come back and do this after we have a shovel, because I want to be able to look at the, we'll, we'll kind of pre-dig. Yeah. I should have thought of that in advance because we got a branch root. We want to dig that up, take a look at it. We want to examine the, the crown difference between these. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I should have thought Don't about mind. that ahead of time. Okay. But, okay. Where can we? We need to look at some bird's foot tree pool. Might just pan right down. Is this the small stuff right there? Yeah. Here. I'm totally ready to pause for you. Ready? Okay. Yes. Um, one little legume that I like to include in pasture mixers is this bird's foot trefoil. And bird's foot trefoil is a uh, finds a lot of merit because it is a non-bloating legume. It contains condensed tannins that will complex with the bloat-causing proteins. Not only is this non-bloating, but they've done research that that shows that if about 10% or more of the diet is bird's fit trefoil. The other 90% can be pre-bloom alfalfa, and the animals will not blow. The, the condensed tannin in it is that effective. Um, the condensed tannins also will complex with the protein and turn it into bypass protein, where instead of being broken down by microbes in the rumen, will go directly and get digested in the small intestine, which is much more efficient for the animal. Uh, they will gain better on uh, tree foil or a mixture of tree foil and alfalfa than they will on alfalfa alone. And so a uh, very nutritious plant. It does reseed itself. Um, you can tell it's, it's not as productive as alfalfa, so we don't, you know, even though it's very safe, uh, if you go straight tree foil, you give up a lot of production. That's one reason I, I like to have diversity out there, a little tree foil, a little alfalfa, you get the best of both worlds, the safety plus the alfalfa production. So it does reseed itself, so it, it can live for a long time in a pasture setting. Even though the individual plants usually only last two or three years, the stand can last a long time if, you, if your grazing pressure is low enough that you allow it to reseed. This is alcite clover, and alcite clover uh, finds its best utility in uh, wet soils and acid soils. It, Want to start right over? Yeah. Like we're on a farm or something. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're good. Okay. This is alcite clover, and the we find. The best use for alcite clover in places that are too acid or too wet for other legumes. Alfalfa, for example, requires a very uh, well-drained neutral soil for best productivity. Alcite um, will tolerate soil acidity and will tolerate very wet feet. Under uh, cool, wet conditions, it's a very productive legume. It's also very nutritious. Um, the drawback of alcite clover is that it does not take heat and drought well. Also, it uh, um, tends to be fairly short-lived, not as productive as alfalfa under good conditions. Um, one other drawback is that alcite clover is toxic to horses. I would not include this in any blend that may be grazed to horses. It's, it's not 100% kill every horse that touches it, but it, it has enough hazard that we try not to have have it in the mix designed for horses.